Hi, I'm Jeff Krasno, and welcome to Commune, where every week we explore the ideas, values, and practices that bring us together and help us live healthy and purpose-filled lives. We talk to research scientists, congressmen, spiritual leaders, world-class athletes, and founders of international institutes about everything from personal wellness practices to ideas that inspire us to take action. Welcome to Commune. Subscribe now for weekly episodes. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, a.k.a. Siskel and Ebert. Save it, CILC. And uh, Jerry's over there. I guess she's Jean Shallot. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the uh, stuff you should know triumvirate. I don't know why that tickled me so much. Because Jean Salat's a funny looking, I guess. Yeah. Jerry's not. I'm just picturing her with a big afro and a mustache <laughs> and like a tweed jacket and bad opinions about movies. Jean Shallot had a look for sure. Still, uh, he's around, right? Uh, oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, RIP both uh, Siskel and Ebert. So sad. I know. Um, have you seen the Roger Ebert documentary? No, I've heard nothing but good things. Really, really good. Very touching. Yeah. What is it? Uh, uh, something life, life uh, like mine, life with me, life on top, life itself, life with thumbs, life itself, life itself, <laughs> life with thumbs. <laughs> it was really great, and I watched it on. Made the mistake of watching it on a plane, and I was just like, <laughs> my allergies are acting up. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I was I was watering because of your allergies. No, because I was sad. I was crying. Do you want me to say it? Uh, yeah. I was crying on a plane. I was confused there for a second. <laughs> That's better than when I watch other movies that are on my laptop that are like, uh, have like bad violence or, or nudity or something. I'm always just like, oh, and I kind of lower the laptop and <laughs> it's like, I didn't realize this was in here. And the lady next to me is just like, ugh. <laughs> you disgust me. Yeah. Cause I don't, you, I want to be sensitive to the people around me, and you know? I'm not one sure. of those jerks. It's like just lives in my own bubble. It's like watching some sex scene on a plane. <laughs> You're like elbowing the lady. Check this next out. To you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I hate it. I was, just, it was so embarrassed. That happened to me a couple of times. I'm like, I needed to start going PG on movies. Yeah, you just looked at her like uh, airplanes. <laughs> Judd Apatow, huh? Am I right? He's unpredictable. Yeah. All right. So, Chuck, this is your episode to shine, man. Is it? Yes. You're a movie guy too though. I like movies, but I've I almost consciously don't let myself watch movies on a like a film aficionado level. Oh right. You're because, just pure enjoyment. Uh, yeah, I don't sure. ever want to see the individual shots and just be like, Oh well that could have been better or whatever. Yeah. Um and and just miss the movie as a whole. Yeah, I fall somewhere in the middle of that. I try to let go, but um like our our Video producer director Casey is is pretty bad about that, and our buddy Scotty, who shot our TV show, uh-huh. oh, he's the worst. Yeah, he's just oh, you know, the camera work and that lighting in that scene. Yeah. <laughs> Scott's awesome. Hey Scott. Hey Casey. They're all in here with us in spirit. And hey, this is the last show in this studio. Yeah, last episode in the old office. Yep, the I murder room. Couldn't feel more neutral about it. I actually feel less than neutral. Less than zero. It's it's weird. That was a good movie. Thank you. Great shots. Yeah. I say thank you as if I directed it. Lot, right. <laughs> I not only directed it, I also played <laughs> Andrew McCarthy. Uh, yeah, I'm ready to get the heck out of here, man. Can't wait to get in that new office. And the, yeah, it's going to be good. Tiny little dedicated studio. Whole new world. All right. Let's do this. Okay, so Chuck... Films, you've seen one or two of them in your time. Sure. Have you seen any of the ones in this list? I know you've seen a few of them, but have you seen like some of the early ones? I've seen, well, we'll just go piece by piece because I have not seen Battleship Potemkin. Okay. Um, but I do love Mandy Potemkin. <laughs> it's a little different. <laughs> yes. In spelling, pronunciation, <laughs> meaning, the whole thing. Uh-huh. But it's close, I guess. But we're talking, of course, about films that change filmmaking. Mm-hmm. In some way or another. And the first one on the list is from 1925, Battleship Potemkin. That's hard for me to say. Which is not the first Potemkin. movie, by the way. The first screen movie was Workers Leaving the Lumiere Factory, which is 47 seconds long and the most yeah. boring piece of celluloid anyone's ever put yeah. together. But it was the first. That's right. 
This was many years. That was a full 30 years before Battleship Potemkin. By the time 30 years had passed, like we were doing like narratives and there was banning and all sorts of great stuff. Yeah. And Battleship Potemkin f- fell under uh, both of those umbrellas. It was a narrative story. It was a silent movie. That's right. But it told a pretty clear story. And it was a bit of Russian propaganda as well. Yeah, it tells the story of uh, a 1905 uprising in uh, where there were Russian sailors uh, basically, uh, there was a mutiny aboard a ship, and then the bad guys, the Cossacks, came in looking for uh, revenge. Yeah, 1905, that would have been rising up against tyranny. It would have been rising up against the um, Romanov monarchy, I guess. Nice. But it was made in 1925, so this is a time when, you know, st- Lenin and Trotsky and all those dudes were running around yeah. trying to do the great experiment. Yeah. And uh, it ends up, it turns out that the battleship Potemkin was banned in some countries. Some countries are like, we don't want this Rusky propaganda. Right. But Russia itself later on banned it when yeah. Stalin came to power because he was a self-aware dictator. Oh, uh, was that the deal? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he knew this could be a metaphor for rising up against my dictatorship. So I'm going to just ban this oh, movie. Oh, yeah. Even though it's Russian propaganda. Hmm. Well... Filmatically, I need to bring the history, by the way. Uh, filmatically speaking, it was a landmark film uh, because of the montage, uh, most notably the Russian or Soviet theory of montage, which is basically that um, your impact is going to come from juxtaposition of shots and not necessarily a smooth sequence of shots. Right. Um, and it should be rhythmic instead of necessarily being tied to the story. It was like a, a, a rhythmic series of shots. And... Um, this one is popular. Um, it was the Odessa step sequence. Uh, is one of the five acts. And it is huge because it has been aped and um, uh, mimicked and mocked and um, homaged probably more than, well, I don't know about more, but a lot of times in film history. Well, yeah, the montage, it's like a go-to editing technique, right? Oh, yeah. Well, the montage in general, but specifically the Odessa steps. Oh, okay. There are two notable parts in that sequence. Uh, one is the, um, you know, it's basically a big charge on these these grand steps leading up to a building and a big battle. In Odessa. <laughs> Odessa, Texas. <laughs> and um, there's a, a part of it where there's the old, the old baby carriage going down the steps, you know, what's going to happen to the baby? And it sounds tired because we've seen that in, uh, you know, the Untouchables, yeah, notably. The, I did not find it tiresome. Uh, na- was Naked thrilled. Gun, thirty-three and a third. <laughs> yeah, uh, everything is illuminated. The great movie by uh, Leo Schreiber. Um, that was from directly from the Odessa step sequence in Battleship Potemkin, nice. the baby carriage. Yeah, and the old um, shot through shot in the eye through the glasses. Oh, cool! That comes from this movie too. They were the first ones to do it. Yeah. Um, and you've seen that in uh, Woody Allen's Love and Death and Bananas. And, of course, The Godfather, the oh, great yeah. sequence where Mo Green's getting the massage and mm-hmm. he looks up and puts on his glasses. During a montage. Yeah, that's exactly like that whole the sequence. The assassination yeah. montage. Yeah, because there was uh, an assassination on the steps as well. Oh, yes. Yeah, so that um, was definitely. It was a double. Who was that? That was uh, Francis Ford Coppola? Oh, yeah. He he was clearly aware of Battleship Potemkin. Clearly. I was trying to think of other examples of montages, and the only thing I could come up with was the A-Team building something. <laughs> but that counts as a montage, right? Yeah, oh yeah. It's like a, some related, in some way, related shots yeah. that are kind of put together that a little bit transcend, like, time it's all, and it's all space. Tell a story in itself. Yeah. Like Rocky training for a fight or yeah, something. Yeah, that's another good one. A lot of times it's set to music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that that's the only one you can think of. Yeah. And, uh, and the great movie Brazil, too, has the uh, shot through the glasses bit, as I like to call it. So that's Battleship Potemkin. Doesn't one of the Nazis in Raiders of the Lost Ark get shot through the glasses? Maybe. That wouldn't surprise me. It's been it's been oft homaged, you know? Yeah. So Battleship Potemkin was a, it made a pretty big splash in 1925. In 1926, the following year, the next movie on the list, um, I, I, it wasn't his first, but it really solidified, I think, his stardom, Buster Keaton's stardom. Yeah, the general. And rightfully so, too. Yeah. He was uh, one of the great... Um, well, some people call him the greatest stuntman to ever live. It, he's done some stuff that I think earns him that. Yeah. Because I mean, this is back in the day, too, where he was legitimately risking his life. Right. 
you know. Like the the very famously where he's standing on the street in uh-huh. front of a house and then the whole front of the house falls over him and the window just goes right around him. Yeah. I watched that again today. <laughs> yeah. It is I can't believe he did that. You in there's actually a half of a second where his arm jerks up cuz he's startled as the yeah. house finally makes its way like into his peripheral vision. Yeah. And it, it has to be one of the most dangerous things a human being's ever done on film. Oh, yeah. I'm sure the whole time before that was like, we did the math, right? You did the math. Do the math again. Do the math again. Yeah. Show me the math. Right. Show me the math. Yeah. Because that's all it was. It was math and measurements. Right. But, uh, yeah, he could have been squashed and killed very easily. And he had a lot of faith in everybody who was pulling off this stunt with him. You know, yeah. he had to just stand there. That yeah. was his whole thing. Was, was he had to just stand there. And his bit was that he um, was he played it straight constantly. He was a stone faced actor. Yeah. Deadpan. Yeah. He kind of started that whole thing because his big um, I was about to say rival, but I guess um, just contemporary uh, Charlie Chaplin, while similar in some ways, was completely different because Chaplin was constantly mugging for the camera and, like, asking for the audience's uh, sympathy. Right, raising his eyebrows or... Yeah, like, look what's happening to me. Come on, come on. Whereas Buster Keaton would just... He had that deadpan look the whole time. Yeah, he would go from, like, a house falling around him to jumping on a train or something like that with just the same blank facial expression. Yeah, and the reason this is a highly influential film, The Generals, because it kind of showcases the best of both. Um, the, the amazing stunts that would be mimicked and uh throughout the years and built upon and then the deadpan style that influenced everyone from obviously bill murray is one of the great deadpan actors of all time yeah like you can count the number of time bill murray even smiles in a movie on like two hands sure much less like apes or laughs or anything michael Sarah's mentioned in here and i'm like uh, he i think he might have bill murray beat as far as deadpan? deadpan actor goes, yeah. Well, Zach Galifianakis is on the list. He's super deadpan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Leslie Nielsen, of course. Amy Poehler, I think, is a uh, is a, a woman that's a very deadpan. Yeah. Uh, has a deadpan style. Jason Schwartzman. Yes. But people say this is this all is a direct descendant of Buster Keaton's work. Yeah, and if you think we're overstating this, go watch any Buster Keaton movie. Yeah. You will be thrilled and delighted. And if your attention span has been shredded to ribbons by the Internet, just go on to YouTube and type in Buster Keaton, and it'll bring up all sorts of um, clips of his yeah. awesome stunts. It's pretty great. You will be thrilled and amazed, I promise. Yeah, and I think I made a note here, by the way, that we have a uh, Fatty Arbuckle retraction to make. Uh, remember when we... <laughs> We called him out as the uh, rapist murderer. I didn't say murderer. Well, we said rapist at least. Right. But uh, we were taken in task by a fan. He was he had he was acquitted of all that stuff, and apparently didn't do uh, uh, either act, and um, his career and life and family name were ruined forever. Huh. So he was um, evidently done a grave misjustice, and we uh, sort of cavalierly just uh, still called him that today. Yeah, I need to look into it more. Uh, all right. So next up we have. The Jazz Singer, the 1927 edition. Not the Neil Diamond one. No, and there was one in between, too, uh, with Danny Thomas, oh, I yeah. believe. Um, I like Neil Diamond's. It's good. I never saw it. Did you ever see it? No. No, it's not bad. Um, but this is the original from Alan Crossland, and it is notable because it was the first feature-length uh, movie that was at least 25% spoken dialogue right does that make sense yeah it's totally new yeah it it wasn't it wasn't the first talkie because they had short films that were talkies right and there was a movie the next year i'm sorry yeah in 1928 called lights of new york that had 100 percent full spoken dialogue but the jazz singer had a mix of music and spoken dialogue right the first big big daddy feature length film to do so right with substantial dialogue right yeah and they they did it in the most roundabout, difficult way that you could possibly do it, which is to record the audio and the the soundtrack, both the dialogue and the music, mm-hmm. onto vinyl records, yeah. probably wax records, really. And then um, the projectionist had to sync the record up with the film strip, so everything was in sync. Yeah, it was a device called a Vitaphone that Warner Brothers uh, sunk about half a million into. Uh, this company called Western Electric, who invented it. And it was actually physically connected to the projector's motor. Uh. Um, 
so they did while they did have to sync it it was it was a, a physical connection mm-hmm. between the phonograph player and the projection uh uh reel i guess yeah and it went on to gross three and a half million bucks for 1927 that's man a lot of dough that's a ton of dough that's like five six million dollars today at least yeah <laughs> at least but uh was ineligible for the best picture because they were just like you, you can't compete with the rest it's not fair Oh, wow. Because everything else is silent and everyone's going to vote for you. Yeah. So that changed the whole game for sure. Uh, we will continue on with our awesome and engrossing list right after this. Hello, I'm Tracy V. Wilson. I host the podcast Stuff You Missed in History Class with my friend and colleague Holly Fry. Over the past few years, every day on our social media, we've been talking about what happened on this day in history. So Bayard Rustin, a pacifist and activist who helped plan the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, was born on this day in 1912. Or on this day in 1789, women marched on Versailles to demand a solution to an enormous food shortage. Those things did not happen on the same day, but you get the picture. So for years, we'd been doing that, and it suddenly dawned on us, what if this was its own podcast? So that's what we're doing. Starting July 1st, we're launching kind of a little sister podcast to Stuff You Missed in History Class. It's called This Day in History Class. It's about five minutes a day, every day, and it gives you the highlights of something notable that happened on that day in history. So come and listen. You'll be able to find This Day in History Class on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and wherever else you find podcasts. So, Chuck, um, if you'll notice, the first three movies in our list, the first three films that changed everything, happened in 1925, 26, and 27. Things were changing fast. <laughs> they really were. I yeah. mean, like, we by leaps and bounds. Sure. But you can also make the case that there was a lot of new ground to cover. So just about anybody who did anything new that was noteworthy it was should an innovation. It. Yeah, it was a big innovation. Yeah. Yeah. Harder to innovate these days. It is. Um, and if you'll notice uh, on the list, um, so the, the earliest ones were like technical editing innovations. Um, now, starting with Citizen Kane from 1941, we start to get into innovations in storytelling, which yeah. is a, a, a lot more nuanced than, you know, um, doing your own stunts or uh, using a montage or something. It's It's figuring out how to tell a story in a much less linear narrative fashion. Yeah. And Citizen Kane was one of the early ones to pioneer a non-linear narrative. Yeah, did you uh you saw this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't see it till I mean it was probably like uh probably about 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. But like way later than you would think I would have seen this. Yeah. As a big film buff. I saw it in college at a um in a film class. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Off the, yeah. If you sign up for a film class, you're going to study Citizen Kane. <laughs> exactly. Pretty much. And I finally found out what Rosebud was. Don't ruin it. I won't. <laughs> uh, but it is a landmark film in every way, and it has often been top of best films of all time lists for great reasons. Um, one of which, like you said, the non-linear narrative was a really unique thing at the time. Um, although Flashback wasn't uh, brand new, it was the first time it had been this extensive yeah. and effective in the story. Yeah, because, so. I mean, it's substantial enough that it really cuts up the flow. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not like a quick flashback and they come back and the actor's, like, staring off into space to right. transition <laughs> back into the present again. <laughs> I mean, like, it was all over the place. Yeah. You know? uh, some of the more um, concrete cinematic uh, landmarks, uh, one was using deep focus, uh, Director of photography Greg Toland, legend, used uh, he had used deep focus before on a movie called Long Voyage Home, but um, it's all over the place in Citizen Kane, and that basically means if you see a shot where something uh, very far away is in focus in the shot, mm-hmm. basically where everything's in focus, or the background and the foreground are yeah. in focus, so you can press pause and look around exactly like you're sticking your head into a box. Yeah, that's called deep focus. Yeah. And it was brand new, uh, as far as Citizen Kane, uh, goes, is how extensive it used it. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things was, um, off-center framing. Um, it was a big, 
you know, pretty common thing to just center whatever the main action was, either the, the character or the object. Mm-hmm. And, um, Citizen Kane had a lot of things where the main focus of the scene, the character may be even off screen, uh, which was really weird at the time. People didn't know what to think of it. Right. Um, expressionistic lighting. Uh, back then everything, they, they just lit it. They're like, make sure everything's well lit. Yeah. Um, but well, isn't Otto Preminger also like a big pioneer with that? Yeah, I think so. With, um, Dial M for Murder, or I think he directed that. Was it Hitchcock? I think that was Hitchcock. Was it? Okay, well, Otto Preminger Ew. directed stuff like that, though, right? He was very, he used moody lighting and shadows yeah. and stuff a lot. I probably messed that up. People are going to be... Dial M for Murder, I think it was Preminger. Okay. Um, but uh, Orson Welles, of course, I don't think we even mentioned that, too, wrote, directed, and starred, and produced, and I think he even edited Citizen Kane. Yeah, I just assumed everybody knew that, you know? Yeah. Um, he came from the theater where uh, you create a mood with lighting, uh, only certain parts of the stage. So he brought that into the movies, and uh, it was very um, evocative and set the mood well. Mm-hmm. And people are like, man, why are we lighting everything all bright all the time? Look at Citizen Kane. <laughs> it yeah. really worked. Yeah. A um, couple of other things, one of which I know you will appreciate, sir, is that he pretty much invented the wipe. Oh, the star wipe? Not the star wipe. Uh, but it <laughs> followed. Yeah, the star wipe followed. Okay. Which I know is your favorite transition in cinema. Yeah, oh, it's all star wipe. Star wipe. Because <laughs> it almost makes a beep sound, you know? Uh, and By the, the way, I want to say you're right. Yeah. Dallin for murder was Hitchcock. Oh, was it? Yeah. Oh, okay. What was premature? Did you look that up? He did one called Laura, the man with the golden arm. It's not who I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of a director named Otto. Who directed in like the twenties or thirties, hmm. and he directed like moody, um, like like moody movies, like yeah, murder movies, yeah, yeah, like big. film noir. Yes, film noir. That's exactly what I was going for, and I don't remember who it was. Maybe his name was Otto Film Noir. <laughs> He's French. Um, and then one final thing, of course, the you could study Citizen Kane for a week in a film class. Mm-hmm. So this is an overview, but um, the low angle shots. Um, people didn't use a lot of low or high angle shots back then. It was kind of just shot from straight on. And, um, Orson Welles even dug out, uh, cut out the floor a lot of times to get the camera lower. Wow. And for the first time we saw ceilings in view, uh, in a movie because quite often things were shot on a sound stage where you don't have ceilings. And, um, he wanted those low angle shots. So they used, um, fabric, uh, most times to act as a ceiling, but very effective shots of, from below of uh, Orson Welles as, uh, I mean, it wasn't exactly William Randolph Hearst, but it was an approximation of William Randolph Hearst. Right. So very effective low angle stuff that now, I mean, we take for granted all these things. Right. Um, but, you know, there would be no Pulp Fiction in that uh, nonlinear storytelling if there was no, well, maybe somebody would have done it. but <laughs> <laughs> Maybe eventually, but, he you was know, the first. he did the first and, and I, that's why it was innovative. Exactly. It's Fritz Lang. That I was yeah, there you go. Yeah. Fritz Lang. Metropolis. And M. Just M. That's okay. Yeah. It's all making sense now. I get confused. Yeah, but you were right on, you were right there. Fritz and Otto are not close. I mean, they're both German, but that's about it. Yeah, but do you know what the difference between M and dial M? Just a telephone. <laughs> <laughs> What's up next, Chuck? Breathless. One of my faves. So I am going to uh, rely on you mostly for this one because I looked up what the French New Wave really did, what it accounted for. Yeah. And like all of the essays I found were uh, hard to, they were dense. Yeah. And I didn't really understand. I understood that the French New Wave like changed everything. Yeah. And that a lot of the movies that I know and love today are the the, um, offspring of the French New Wave, but I still didn't get exactly specifically what the French New Wave did. And you're going to rely on me to summarize this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no pressure? No. Well, for me, the French New Wave basically ushered in an era of uh, what now I think most people might associate with indie filmmaking. Okay. Okay. Like uh, handheld camera work mm-hmm. and what some people at the time considered amateurish camera work. Mm-hmm. Um, movies where maybe not a lot seemingly happens. You know, nothing grand happens, which was the case in Breathless. A lot of people didn't like it at the time because it was like, you know, not much happens. You know, the the 
the two leads in the movie, uh, John Paul Belmondo and Gene Seberg weren't really like, didn't show, express a whole lot of deep love and you know, there weren't these big moments of love and affection and these huge action sequences and it was described as flat by a lot of people. Um, and I think a lot of indie movies do that, just kind of show life as it happens. Yeah, so without Breathless, we wouldn't have, like, Bottle Rocket. Maybe. Wes Anderson's definitely a, a big French New Wave guy. Yeah. For sure. Um, but uh, Godard, Jean-Luc Godard, who directed it, and Truffaut and some other um, French New Wave forefathers were film critics at first. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and they decided as a group, like, we want to look at cinema in a new way, um, and do something different. So they went and started making their own movies. That's like uh, James Fenimore Cooper. Oh, uh, yeah? The guy who wrote Last of the Mohicans. Oh, really? Yeah, he apparently used to complain that, like, nobody wrote good books anymore. And so uh, I think his wife or something said, well, why don't you do it, big shot? And he did. And the books he wrote really? weren't, weren't so great, but he, he, he went and wrote them. <laughs> and he wrote a bunch of them, too. One of my favorite far sides ever is the um, second to the last of the Mohicans. It's just a line of uh, of Native Americans and the second to the last one. They're online facing away. Uh-huh. He's just sort of turning around and waving at the, <laughs> at the camera. That is a good one. Or I guess the camera at Gary Larson's hand. Um, so Breathless is notable for those reasons. It kind of kicked off the French New Wave. But the use of uh, jump cut editing, mm-hmm. which we see so much now, it was the first movie. And it was very jarring at the time to see jump cuts in a movie. Yeah, I'll bet. Uh, and that's when you're showing, like, uh, I guess the best way to describe it is um, multiple shots of the same f- subject or thing from different angles. Right. It's like um, you indicate the progression of time or movement yeah. or something by just cutting quickly rather than focusing on somebody walking down the street for five minutes. Yeah. You cut a couple of times and all of a sudden they're just closer to the camera and then closer and closer and then they're past yeah. the camera. It's a jump cut. Yeah, or, or even a simple something as simple as like, you're going to leave the house, so you go and pick up your keys and you put on your coat. Instead of showing all that, you come out of the bedroom, boom, you're putting on your coat, boom, you're putting the keys in the door. Right, exactly. You're just showing the high highlights of yeah. this progression of stuff where that would otherwise be boring to watch the whole thing. But yeah. it also um, is used to create tension, too. Yeah. It, because it, it's it's um, jarring, yeah. I guess, is probably why it creates tension. And Scorsese famously used it in Goodfellas. Oh, yes. At the end, when Henry Hill is, like, like trying to sell some guns the to... The cocaine uh, sequence. ...to Nero. Yeah, he's yeah. coked to the gills, right? And he's, like, trying to sell some guns to Nero, but they don't fit the silencers. And, like, he's the helicopter's following him. He's got yeah. the sauce going. And all this stuff is being represented and compressed in yeah. a very short amount of time by... The use of jump cuts. Yeah, very effective. And for budding filmmakers, it's a great way to hide mistakes um, oh, yeah. of things you may not have gotten that you thought you got. Yeah. Um, jump cutting is a really easy way to, to just sort of, uh, yeah, to hide your errors. Yeah. I, I did it a lot, in other words, when I was making those shorts. I um, I was, I realized that in my head I was referencing the um, shot in Soul Taker. You know, have you ever seen that Mystery Science <laughs> 3000? With, uh-uh. uh, it's, um, his last name is Estevez. It's Martin Sheen's brother. Uh-huh. And uh, he is a soul taker, and he's next to this guy wh- who's a soul taker. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to see this. But anyway, they're, they're walking down the road, and this jump cut like has this progression of them. Right. It, it's so unnecessary, but it's like yeah. a, a great use of jump cut. You could tell the director was like, I can't wait to use a jump cut. And that's yeah. what she did. She used it on... Um, but go watch that MST3K. It's a good one. Man, you did you see every single one of those episodes? No, it's still, I, I still run across really? ones that I haven't seen. Yeah. Nice. Um, hey, and a shout out to Bill Corbett, who I know is a listener. Oh, yeah, he is, isn't he? Yeah, I don't know if he's going to hear this one, but um, the great Bill Corbett. Soul taker. <laughs> uh, next, we are going to move on to Federico Fellini's. Eight and a half. You ever seen this one? No, I haven't. It's good. Now I understand why it's called that, though. Yeah, it was one of the first, although not the first, movies about movie making. And uh, starring the great Marcello Mastroianni Mast- from La Dolce Vita, mm-hmm. uh, a muse of uh, Fellini's over the years, too. And this one, um, this one really kicked off the surrealist filmmaking 
and sort of saying you can play around and shoot a dream sequence where the the guy's in traffic and then he leaves his car and floats up in the air and is right. you know being pulled down to the ground on the beach from a rope tied around his ankle just like go nuts yeah and successive filmmakers did go nuts like yeah. um Gondry did uh Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind oh yeah he's hugely influenced um Darren Aronofsky mm-hmm. did some weird stuff here or there yeah um, David Lynch and Terry Gilliam of course yeah just basically surrealism is is what I'm taking Fellini introduced into this. Yeah, for real. And um, besides the surrealism, uh, that opening sequence of eight and a half where the director, um, he's the director in the movie, uh, Guido, is stuck in traffic. It's really claustrophobic feeling, and that's why he floats away uh, and escapes, you know, that, that traffic jam. But that was directly mimicked in, like, R.E.M.'s Everybody Hurts video. Oh, yeah. And... Um, the beginning of the movie Falling Down. Do you remember that? Uh-huh. That started with the traffic jam that yeah. Michael Douglas just left. He doesn't float. He gets <laughs> like an Uzi. I saw that again the other day, most of Does it. Does it hold up? It's weird. It alternately felt way ahead of its time mm-hmm. and also very dated. Yeah. Because the stuff that Michael Douglas was doing felt way ahead of its time. Uh, but then there was, I just forgot about that whole um, weird subplots with Robert Duvall retiring and he had this wife that was henpecking him and like this retirement party they were trying to throw him. I forgot about that too. Yeah, it was just so unnecessary huh. and felt really weird and out of place the other day Yeah, when I was watching it. Was there like a jump cut montage where he's putting on his watch, his gold <laughs> retirement watch? No. Huh. But then too, the Barbara Hershey, you know, is in Venice at home with the daughter and he spends a whole day coming there to grab them basically mm. and the whole time she just keeps calling the cops like i know he's coming i know he's coming and i was watching the other day i was like freaking leave oh yeah like, what are you doing there yeah that's a movie character thing yeah you know that's just bad writing bad directing when you just walk right past the yeah. ability to leave there's you you missed a huge step where were we falling down yeah i you, think that pretty much sums up eight and a half i think so too falling down boom so, Chuck, uh, we got a little more left. We got more films. Is this making you want to watch films? Yeah. Me too. I feel like eating ice cream, watching a film, and scratching from Poison Ivy lately. Yeah, and burning this office down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know if that happens now, suspicion's going to fall on you for saying that. That's all right. Uh, we'll be right back after this. <laughs> Hi, I'm Allison Green, and I'm the host of the Ask a Manager podcast, where I answer questions from listeners about how to navigate all sorts of sticky situations at work, from what to say to a coworker who smells, to how to deal with an overly critical boss, to how to handle someone who takes credit for your work. Each week on the show, we'll talk through and hopefully solve your toughest, most frustrating, or just plain weirdest work predicaments. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, so we're back with our awesome jingles, <laughs> which, by the way, um, we we have to thank uh, John Begin. Begin. Yeah. John Begin. Begin yeah. the begin. He even emailed with the pronunciation of I his know. name. But he, um, the original guy who did our jingle, the first jingle ever, yeah. Rusty Mattias, or Matthias. <laughs> Man, I'm not good with the pronunciation. Uh, well, anyway, Rusty, whose uh, band The Sheepdogs are on tour right now. Yeah. Um, just because his work was so original, we contacted him and said, hey, we've got this other guy who's done like covers of your work. Can we use these? It's like totally. Mash and, it up, brother. Yeah. And John's been making awesome like versions of it ever since. Yeah. They're both great and talented. Thanks to you both. And go check out, uh, I think, what did you say? They're on tour, right? Yeah, the Sheepdogs. Yeah, go check out the Sheepdogs. Yeah. In a town near you. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, finish with these two in reverse order. Okay. Toy Story. Was a big one, hugely innovative, big huge. landmark film. Huge. Oh yeah. And again, it's one of those things where now almost everything about it seems pedestrian. Sure. Or what it did. Yeah, yeah. See, it's still a great movie, I'm sure. Oh yeah. Um, but the the innovations that it, it undertook are just seem pedestrian. But at the time, it was totally groundbreaking. Yeah, game like, changer. It was the first um 
the first CGI movie, all CGI movie ever. Yeah. That was enormous. Well, yeah, and I remember at the time seeing it and just being like, wow, this yeah. is the future of animated films. What's the best C- all CGI animated film you've ever seen visually? Uh, well, I haven't seen a lot of them these days because Emily doesn't like those. Mm-hmm. So I probably wouldn't be the best person to ask. Holly from uh, Stuff Mom or uh, Stuff oh, You yeah. Missed in History Class, yeah. she'd probably be the one to ask. Uh, f- for my money, uh-huh. have you seen The Adventures of Tintin? Oh, yeah. That was amazing. Mind blowing. Yeah, I saw that on your recommendation and really, really liked it. Yeah. Uh-huh. The story was great. The action was great. The characters were great. But the CGI, the yeah. computer animation is, I think, possibly the best ever done. Yeah, and that's a bit of a different style than, say, like Up or um, The Incredibles. It's not nearly as cartoonish. It's like the... What? I think it's the motion capture. Yeah. I think that's what they did for that. Oh, yeah. With Up, it would strictly be totally just animation, right? Yeah, but, I mean, they're both animation. Right. Um, but, yeah, man, Tintin, that was really good. It was good. I was surprised how much I liked that. But Up was good, too, and Toy Story was good, too. And But all of these things came as a result of the, the ground that Toy Story broke. Absolutely. In 1995... Um, like you said, what seems like a common uh, thing today. I mean, you don't see cell animation anymore. It's almost. I know. I kind of miss it. I totally miss like it. Like the new um, Mickey Mouse is all weird and CG. Like yeah. stuff from our generation should have just been discontinued. Yeah. And then you just come up with all new stuff that's CGI. Strawberry Shortcake, not supposed to be CGI. It just all looks weird now. Yeah. I wish there would have people would have done a little bit of both still. Because I think cell animation, like, uh, I think the Iron Giant came out after Toy Story, and they did cell animation. Yeah. And that was great. Yeah. Great movie. I haven't seen that. Oh, it's really good. You'd like it. Uh, like, it was a movie for grown-ups. Sure. And Toy Story sort of laid the way for that, because uh, it was one of the first movies, um, I guess, k- cartoony kids' movies, to really have a lot of dialogue that flew over kids' heads that adults got a little nod and a wink. What, Toy Story? Yeah. Yeah. Not like dirty humor, but it's not like Fritz the Cat. No, no, no. But a little entendre here and there that adults might appreciate that kids won't understand. Right. Those are the best jokes. Right. <laughs> um, and now we have you know best animated uh, feature in the Oscars, which definitely came straight out of uh, the original Toy Story because movies started being considered before they created its own category. Uh, Up and Toy Story three were actually nominated for regular best picture. Yeah. And I think everyone was like, ooh, we need to get them in their own category because yeah. we can't have an animated movie win Best Picture, can well, we? Well, Up would have come after um, the the Best Animated Picture category came out. Oh, really? So that kind of goes as a testament to yeah. just how amazing that movie is. Yeah, that's right. That, was that it was still up for Best Picture. Oh, it was both? I don't know if it was up for – it probably was up for Best Animated as well, but it was definitely also up for Best Picture oh, wow. while there was an animated category. Yeah. I never considered that. Bam. That was a good movie. Yeah. It was sweet. Um, so I got nothing else on Toy Story. Well, then what about the last one? Yeah. 2001 A Space Odyssey. Man. Quite a film. You sent this uh, essay on Criterion. I think Criterion.com, but, you know, the Criterion Collection. Yeah. Um, It was written, I guess, in 1988, (laughs) even though it says posted in 1988. It's like there wasn't an Internet to post it on in 1988. Maybe it means posted, uh, like, in the mail. Maybe. (laughs) Um, But I realized, like, I can read film essays about Stanley Kubrick's work all day long. Yeah, me too. Like, I love that documentary, um, Room 227. E, was it 227? 237. 246? 237. 247? <laughs> you know the one about the shining conspiracy theory. Yeah, the, the number of the room is... Amazing. I can't remember, though. Um, I, I read a bunch of articles. I think 237. Um, I read a bunch of articles around the release of that documentary, yeah. which were basically like film essays on, on The Shining. I read this one amazing one um, from several years ago about Eyes Wide Shut. Oh, yeah, about me too. how it's like a, a masterpiece of sociology. I like love that movie. Sociology. A lot of people hate that movie. Yeah. Um, and then now this, like 2001. I'm sure there's tons out there to consume, but I, I can just read that stuff all day long because that guy yeah. was so just amazingly detailed as a director. Yeah, I agree. I can read more about his work, critical essays on his work than any other director. Right. 
It's just unbelievable. It's almost Can't like it's its own genre. It is. You know? Kubrickian. Yeah. It's got a word named after it. Yeah. And well, it should. Um, so 2001, A Space Odyssey, 1968. Um, blue Minds back then, Blows Minds today. Uh, one for its uh, just the amazing look and the technical achievement. Um, it, it ages really well. I mean, if you yeah. see a movie from 1968 about outer space. It still looks like the future. Yeah, you don't expect it to hold up well. But it totally does. Um, so much so that a lot of the, you know, George Lucas and Ridley Scott were just like, it's done. Right. Like, we might as well give up. Yeah, George Lucas, when Star Wars came out, said, Star Wars is technically comparable, but for my money, 2001 is by yeah. far the better movie. Yeah, everyone was sort of in- intimidated, I think, by how talented Kubrick was. Well, plus also, um, you have to take into account that he made this movie at a time when other sci-fi movies were just pure schlock. Oh, yeah. So not only to to make the movie in this way, this visually amazing and uh, amazing uh, with an audio soundtrack and just totally innovative, it also took like that mindset to yeah. just completely go in a different direction that everybody else has as well. Yeah, of course, I think about Ridley Scott saying that, and then he goes on to make Alien and Blade Runner after that. So, I mean, he, he held and up Prometheus, his And Prometheus, man. Yeah. I, people don't like Prometheus. I don't care. It's a cool movie. No, I liked it, too. I thought, okay, I, I one, just, one flaw, the big flaw to me was, and I'm sure it's like oh, part of the subtext or the context or one of the texts, <laughs> but um, the 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 engineer coming back to life or coming out of hibernation after mm-hmm. however long and just immediately like inflicting violence on these pea-brained humans yeah. who are showing him no threat whatsoever. Yeah. I just thought it was a little, uh, it wasn't explained well enough, right. I think, for my taste. Yeah, I think I agree with you. But when I'm watching a Ridley Scott movie, I just assume if I'm missing something, he has an explanation for it. I'm just not catching it. Yeah, I know what you mean. I'd like, I I think I read some stuff about how it tied into the alien canon Mm -hmm. and realized I need to go see it again with all this knowledge that I wasn't really thinking about. Yeah. And maybe I'd like it more. Yeah. But I haven't done that yet. So back to 2001. um, Oh, yeah. It was uh, also notable for uh, being bookended basically with 30 minutes of silence on both ends of the movie. (laughs) The first 30 minutes are, and when I say silent, I mean no dialogue. Right. And the last 30 minutes have no dialogue. Yeah, the last line comes like a full 30 minutes before the end. Yeah, and over the 146 minutes, there are only 40 minutes of dialogue in the whole thing. And um, that's why I just, when people compare something like Interstellar and call it Kubrickian, I just want to smash. Hulk Did you smash. not like Inter- Interstellar? Not really. Oh, I liked it. I was super let down. Despite McConaughey doing Wooderson <laughs> in the future... <laughs> I still liked it. I even liked him in it. I liked a lot of the parts of it, but um, to me, it's anti-Kubrickian because every 10 minutes, they're explaining everything that's going on oh, all over yeah. again. That was another thing. Just like Inception. Inception. Ellen Page's entire character was written in to explain what was going on every 10 minutes. Yeah, and I felt like Interstellar was the same way. It's like Christopher Nolan needs to just trust his audience a little bit like Kubrick did and say, figure it out or don't. Yeah, no, that's, but that's true. I'm not going to. Stop every 10 minutes just to explain everything. Yeah. Here's what's going on, remember? If you didn't get it right, here's what's going on again. Well, I think if they are labeling something like Interstellar as Kubrickian, right? One of the ways that you can interpret that is that he was, he rooted his 2001 in science fact. Yeah. Right? So like the stuff that the, the astronauts are like dealing with and the things that are going on and the, the conditions of space, that was all factual. Whereas with Interstellar, same thing. They went to really great lengths to do what they could to make yeah, everything to make scientifically factual, aside from the fact that the, the idea that you could go into a black hole and then come back out or something like that, sure. drifting in space, that's not going to happen. But for the most part, Interstellar was scientifically accurate. So maybe that's what they meant when they called it Kubrickian. Because you're absolutely yeah. right. Like, they did explain a lot and went to great lengths to explain a lot. Whereas with, with 2001, you just watch it the first five times, like, what just happened? Yeah. And apparently Cary Grant had that same reaction as well. 
That was Rock Hudson. Rock Hudson, that's right. Yeah, the original screening that Roger Ebert was at in L.A., Uh Rock Hudson just left and said, can somebody tell me what the hell that was about? Yeah, and it wasn't (laughs) even over yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, the reason it it it, uh, has science fact and not science fiction is because Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke, who... Oh, yeah. It wasn't actually a book that was made into a movie. It was a movie, a book made after a movie. Yeah. And they collaborated on both. And... um, they went to Carl Sagan, um, of course, of Cosmos and said, <laughs> he said, you're going to make billions and billions <laughs> of dollars. That was pretty good. Was it? Yeah. That sounded a lot like him. Um, they went to Carl Sagan and said, hey, we want to portray th- these extraterrestrials. Uh, are they, maybe the star child is, uh, or they turned Dave into the star child. Right. Are they humanoids? What are they going to look like? And Sagan was like, they were very unlikely to be humanoid. <laughs> so Kubrick did the smart thing and was just like, well, we just won't show them right. at all. Instead of making a fool of myself, like signs, and making some dumb looking oh, alien. Oh, man. <laughs> man. Let me just not show the aliens. Very smart move. Yeah. Um, getting back to the story of uh, 2001. <laughs> Although I think the village is underrated. Yeah, I can stomach that one. What about, uh, well, you like The Sixth Sense, right? Everybody like The Sixth Sense. Sure. Uh, I guess that was it for him. I loved Unbreakable. Unbreakable. Yeah. That was one where, like, yeah, I think it was maybe even better the second time. Yeah, I still like that movie. Uh, But he also made that uh, Lady in the Water movie Mm -hmm. and the the one with Marky Mark. uh, The people were jumping off. Four Brothers. (laughs) No. Three Kings. <laughs> uh, is it the one in the elevator? No, he, he just produced that. Oh, one. I know what you're talking about. The one where people are like jumping off of buildings and uh, stuff. Inexplicably? Yeah. That, I didn't even. I didn't see that either. I couldn't get through 10 minutes of that movie. So, um, 2001, back to good movies, was, uh, had a three X, three part structure, but not a conventional three act structure that you might be used to in movies, which is why it confounded people like Rock Hudson. Uh, the first, they called them movements. The first movement was the, uh, the Dawn of Man sequence with the, the, the apes with the, with the monolith. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, he has that great part where he throws his little bone tool up in the air. Right. And then it morphs into, well, not morphs, but it, uh, maybe it's a dissolve into the, um, spinning, uh, in outer space. It's of, called a match cut. Yeah, a match cut. And, um, of the rotation of what we now know was a nuclear warhead, uh, because I read that little article, 20 Things You Didn't Know About 2001. Mm-hmm. I didn't know those were nuclear warheads necessarily in outer space. They made it a little more vague, and initially it was going to be uh, more explicit, and they were going to explode it in outer space. Right. But he said, nah, that's a little too close to... Uh, the ending of... Um, strange, love. strange Love. Yeah. yeah, so let's not do that. Yeah. Probably a good choice. Yeah, but uh, some uh, as a result, some people have taken it to mean that like it was a that match cut was supposed to show how far humans have come, right? From using a bone to murder somebody to satellites in space. But if you know that the satellite is actually loaded down with nuclear warheads, it, that match cut demonstrates how little humans have changed oh, yeah. from using a bone to murder somebody to using satellites to murder somebody. The the motif is still the same, and it's murder. Yeah. He's going for some deep things. Oh, yeah. A lot of metaphor happening. Yeah. I Uh, mean, supposedly in every single shot, because he started out as a still photographer, right? Oh, yeah. Supposedly every frame of a Kubrick movie, you there is nothing that isn't unintentional in place there. By him, he did a lot of his own set decorating. Yeah, like the the pencil holder on the desk in the office of the guy at the Shining Hotel. Right. Right. Was where it's supposed to be, right? And if like it, <laughs> if it has like a the picture of a goat head inscribed on it, that means something, right? It's not accidental. <laughs> yeah, although I will say, room two thirty seven, which I think may have been the point, is a little bit like these people are crazy. Not like, oh man, I, I just see what they're saying in all this, right? right. I was just thinking these people are nuts. Right. It, it's, it was just kind of enjoyable to hear their interpretations of it. Well, and I think it had a, it was a comment on obsession. And fandom, yeah. more so than The Shining, for sure. But there, I thought there, uh, some of their ideas were oh, yeah. interesting. Totally, I said Room Two Two Seven, didn't I? Like one <laughs> of was... the conspiracy theories was like Mary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Wasn't Room 227 like a sitcom? Yeah, it was just called 227. Okay, yeah, 227. Yeah. Gotcha. Remember with Jack Hay? She'd be like, Mary. Oh, okay. I, I, That's what my impression was. What'd you think I was doing? Well, I wasn't sure what you meant. Just being a weirdo? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, the second movement was, of course, the, uh, the HAL sequence, the computer, the HAL, uh, was it the HAL 9000? Yeah. Um, really creepy, and HAL ended up being a lot of people's favorite character, even though it was just a voice. The supercomputer on the Discovery ship. Remember, he's like, what are you doing, Dave? <laughs> it's so creepy. I, I had the Mad Magazine spoof of 2001 when I was a kid. It was uh, great. Yeah. Uh, and then the third movement is when Dave uh, moves on to uh, the next stage of human development with these extraterrestrials that you know, only hear. And um, basically, it's when it comes full circle. The third movement. And the third movement is the one that has almost, well, it's really just the second movement that's, yeah, that has dialogue. dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of the alternate titles for 2001, Journey <laughs> Beyond the Stars. <laughs> Terrible. Universe. Not bad. Yeah, okay. Uh, Tunnel to the Stars. Not uh, so great. Planet Fall. <laughs> that sounds bad. <laughs> sounds like a James Bond movie. And then How the Solar System Was Won. As a uh, play on how the West was won. Yeah, which like uh, movie geeks would find that appealing, but everybody else would say that's dumb. You ruined everything. Yeah, and uh, Kubrick was, uh, this is the last thing I have. He was so obsessive uh, with protecting his material that he allegedly, uh, I don't think allegedly, I think he did, yeah. have all the sets and props and miniatures destroyed after he shot it so they would never be reused, which is a common thing at the time. Yeah. Like, hey, we're doing a space movie. Go get that, uh, go get that space ring from Stanley set. Yeah. Let's reuse it for, uh, planet fall. <laughs> he, uh, he also destroyed all of the footage that didn't make it into the original theatrical release. Yeah. Destroyed. It's gone. Yeah. So they wouldn't one day after his death recut it, which they invariably probably would have done. Yep. He's a smart man. Yeah. I could, we, we should just do a podcast on Kubrick. Okay. He, he was, I, I'm down for that challenge. A B.A. dude. Yes. One of my heroes. Yeah. Cinematically. You got anything else? I got nothing else. Uh, if you want to know more about movies, if you like this one, you would probably also love our exploitation episode. Oh, yeah. Exploitation movie that episode. Was a fun one. What else have we talked about movies in? Cannonball <laughs> Run? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that had a lot to do with the movie. Yeah, our James Bond uh, episode. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've had a few of these. And. People always respond to these. They're like, you guys should have a spinoff show. Yeah, do an all-movie podcast. Sure. Maybe one day. Maybe. Remember, if you're looking for any of these, um, press Control-F or Apple-F in your web browser and search that way on our podcast archive page. Uh, you can also search for this uh, article on How Stuff Works by typing movies in and seeing what comes up. And since I said uh, How Stuff Works, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this Mike DuPont really clear something up for us on scientific method. Okay. Uh, hey, guys. It was a great... Um, well, actually, he doesn't say it was great. <laughs> I think I just made that up. Hey, guys. Your scientific method <laughs> podcast has a consistent misuse of what a scientific law is in relation to, uh, to the working of the scientific method. Uh, it appears that you believe that a law, e.g. Newton's law of gravity, is in held uh, in higher esteem than theory, and that eventually a theory matures into a law. Um, I think I probably did think that. Because of politics. Right. You know? Yeah. How a bill becomes a law. <laughs> right, exactly. He says, when in fact theory is considerably more robust than a law, uh, a law is a mathematical model that describes observed behavior, does not answer the why. Right. Theory does uh, answer why something happens. Did we not say that? I thought we did. Well, like, I, I knew that. I remember finding that out from the research. I he, just can't believe it didn't come out of my mouth. He claims we did not. And I feel like I'm learning this, so I definitely did not. Okay, go ahead. But you may have. Uh, for example, Newton's law of gravitational attraction describes the action of two bodies that can be used for pretty much everything. Um, it is perfect for describing what happens, but it cannot tell you why the two items are attracted mm -hmm. or drill down to the underlying mechanism. Yeah, law is like much more succinct. It yeah. just is what it is. Uh, nor is the law even universal and could not be used to explain the uh, perihelion Procession of Mercury's orbit. Burn. In comparison, Einstein's theory of general relativity was eventually used to solve the Mercury issue. Oh, yeah, the Mercury issue. Uh, and the standard model, along with the recent discovery of the Higgs boson by CERN, can answer the 
why do these two masses uh, attracted to each other a question? <laughs> I think what you mean is why are these two masses attracted to one another? Mike? It's pretty teleological. <laughs> uh, theory is considerably more developed and richer than a scientific law, which is more of a tool that is applicable to a wide range of applications. Keep up the good work. That is Mike DuPont. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for that. Of the Valley Forge DuPonts? I think so. Huh. Uh, have you seen Foxcatcher? Oh, no. I've heard it's good. Is it good? No. Oh, really? I don't think so, no. I've heard it's kind of slow. It's beyond slow. Really? Oh, yeah. I, I, I can understand why um, the Academy loved it. or Sure. A lot of people, I'm sure, do like it. I, I was not a fan of Fox Kids. I think people generally seeing like a turn by an actor like Steve Carell doing something really different, they're knocked out by that. No. I still can't believe you didn't like Birdman. No. Spoiler alert for people who have not seen Birdman. The following conversation is full of spoilers. Yes. What didn't you like about it? Um, so I thought, I thought Michael Keaton was good. Okay. Um, who plays his daughter, Emily Blunt? Is that who that is? Uh, Emma Stone. Emma Stone. Excellent. Okay. Um, Ed Norton, even pretty good. Okay. So the acting was fine. Uh, who is Naomi Watts was in it? Yeah. She did great. Uh, okay, so yes, the acting the acting was fine. Sure. I thought the acting was fine. Uh, I thought the photography was amazing. Yeah, the whole seemingly one-take thing kind of knocked you out, probably. I didn't even pick up on that, but yes, yeah. it did. Um, it was more the, uh, the for me, the juxtaposition of the story, mm-hmm. which was pretty boring and, and realistic in everyday life, even though it was about a Broadway production, it was still about the everyday life of it. Sure. Against the surrealism that's like threaded and, and embedded in yeah. throughout the whole movie, I didn't like that. Okay. It was like, choose one or the other, man. Gotcha. It irked me. Um, and uh, and then just so that one part with the critic where Michael Keaton tells off the critic, I yeah. thought Michael Keaton did a wonderful job. Yeah. But just the whole point that it was in there of like the director uh, you know uh, using michael keaton's character to tell off all the critics he's ever wanted to tell oh, off in his gotcha. movie yeah, yeah i just thought it was pretentious yeah and i thought it was kind of clumsy in that sense too right. and it was enough that it it, it tainted it yeah That's and it. then the ending I, I did not like the ending at all yeah at all that'll ruin a good movie because it was com- it completely went contrary to all the other stuff that he went out of his way to point out was yeah. fake or fraudulent or not real. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it is? What? Yeah. No, choose one or the other. The director f- refused to make very important decisions, and I think that that ruined the movie. That is a very well uh, thought out uh, criticism, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, man, that was the end of Listener Mail even, wasn't it? Yeah, because now I'm not like, geez, Josh is weird. He didn't like Birdman. Now I'm like, Josh didn't like Birdman. He has good reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I like justifying my opinion. <laughs> Don't we all? Uh, so if you want to get in touch with Chuck and I, uh, or Jerry, uh, who I apparently just spoiled Birdman for, um, you can contact us via Twitter at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can send us an email to StuffPodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. This episode of Stuff You Should Know is brought to you by Fiverr.com. Fiverr is the world's largest marketplace for digital services like graphic design and marketing and video and audio production, website building, basically anything you want, on time and on budget. Just browse the site for the service you need and place your order. And for a limited time, use the code STUFF20 and get 20% off your first order. Visit Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com and enter STUFF20 